Peter Gauci, I am the Arthur Watt Senior Research Fellow in Public International Law at Bickle at the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. Um, let me just start by thanking you all for joining us this afternoon for the presentation of the results of this research project. Um, I will provide some kind of initial remarks and thanks and then we'll pass on uh, to uh, Dr. Paolo Mirpuri from the Mirpuri Foundation and then we'll have a presentation of the report findings and then we'll also we'll switch to a discussion um, with three, our three experts who will be introducing briefly. Um, but before I do any of that, let me just start by thanking a number of people that um, need to be thanked because without them, this research would not have been possible. Uh, so first of all, it's members of the expert group um, that were involved in the project. So Irini, Felicity and Gabby were three of them, but we had other uh, members of that panel and I, I won't list all of them, but th their names are listed on the report, which is now available on the BITL website. Um, I also wanted to thank a number of workshop participants. So as you will see from the report, the findings of the report as they developed were discussed in various workshops and there were always very interesting questions and discussions that obviously fed into the, the research. And I would like to thank all those participants as well. Uh, a number of colleagues at Bickel also contributed by um, reading early drafts. Um, that included people who work in Law of the Sea issues, so Constantinos Yelorides, um, as well in Business and Human Rights, so uh, Lee Smith, as well as the people working on migration, so Iris Anastasiadou and Didel Henley, um, who provided quite extensive feedback uh, on the report. Uh, another word of thanks is to the Mirpuri Foundation. Uh, without their financial support, would not have been it would not have been possible to do this project um, and to under undertake this research. We're very happy to welcome Dr. Mirpuri on the panel today. But I just also wanted to thank Anna Agostino, who was our contact person at the foundation over the course of the project for her uh, patience and support uh, throughout the duration of the project, uh, as well as, as before, before that. Um, and finally, there's one person who is not on the panel today, but without who uh, we wouldn't have finished the, this project, which is Francesca Romana Partipilo, who was a research assistant working um, with me on this project uh, in, the early, in the early stages of the project. Um, over the course of 2019, but she's remained involved in the work of Bickel um, as she's moved on to do her PhD um, in Italy. I believe she's in the audience, so thank you very much, uh, Francesca. Uh, just one logistical question. So you have a Q&A function on your uh, screens. If you have any questions, please do feel free to um, ask questions that way. We will pick up questions as we go, but we'll primarily pick up questions towards the end um, of the session. So the next thing I wanted to do is introduce very briefly the speakers. Um, many of them do not need any introduction. So first of all is Dr. Paolo Mirpuri, who is the president of the Mirpuri Foundation. Uh, our second speaker is Professor uh, Irini Papa Nicolo, Nicola Pulu, um, who is a professor of international law at the Università degli Studi di, Bicocca, di Milano Bicocca, uh, and was previously Marie Curie Fellow at Oxford University. Our other speaker is Dr. Felicity Attard, who is a lecturer in international law at the University of Malta, as well as being a graduate of IMLI and of the University of Malta. And our final speaker is Gabrielle Holly, who is a senior advisor in human rights and business at the Danish Institute for Human Rights, and previously was an associate at Omnia Strategy, and previous to that also worked at Bethel and we used to share an office uh, where she worked on, on human rights. So with that, I will pause the word to Paolo. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome and thank uh, the participation of all the guests that are listening to us today and to the panel uh, with who uh, we will uh, share the, the next hour or so. And I think will be a very interesting uh, uh, discussion about a very important matter. As we all know, uh, the migration from the from the south of the Mediterranean Sea into into Europe has been a major uh, problem uh, for um, for uh, for Europe, but above all for the risk that the migrants put themselves uh, while trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, looking for a better place uh, for themselves and their families. Uh, different countries had different approaches. The situation was really confusing. 
and um, there were a number of questions uh, that uh, were not answered uh, by any by anybody that we spoke with mainly at the government level uh, how should a private vessel for instance react uh, when they face uh, a raft full of migrants trying to cross the sea um, the first responsibility for sure is to help and save human lives but it's important for the captains of these vessels to understand the legal implications and liabilities uh, and uh, when we spoke with a number of um, uh, institutions about this issue we found out that this was a, uh, there was a lot of um, misinformation about a lot of unknowns uh, and most of the questions actually remain without without an answer so it was with a great pleasure that we when we start discussing with Bickle uh, I think uh, almost two years ago uh, uh, on this issue uh, and uh, we were quickly convinced that this was a very important study and uh, we immediately accepted the the, the um, uh, the offer to support this study um, that uh, would clarify uh, at the multinational level uh, the answers, the right answers from a legal perspective for all uh, these issues. And I think that what we hear along the next uh, uh, minutes and maybe hour or so will be around, around this matter and I think will be very interesting. So thank you so much, uh, Jean-Pierre and, uh, and the rest of the panel. And I pass back the, 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 the word to you, Jean-Pierre. Thank you very much, Paolo. Um, let me just share my slides. Um, yeah, so I will um, spend the next few minutes talking about some of the more salient features or some of the more salient findings from the research. And I think the other panelists will then be able to explore in a bit more detail some of the particular perspectives. Um, I did want to introduce um, two books that were kind of instrumental in doing this research and, and they're authored by two members of the panel. So Felicity, Felicity's book on the duty of the shipmaster as well as Irini's book on how international law protects people at sea. And I think they are they were kind of core reading as I was going through this research. Um, and I, I did want to mention that in the introductions, but, but I forgot, so I will mention them now. Um, but just starting with the context of the research. So the reality in the Mediterranean and in various other places is, as we have seen, that various people are crossing um, oceans in order to seek safety and protection. Part of that is because there are no legal pathways to protection. Um, what we see is that resettlement opportunities, for example, are extremely limited. Um, visa, protected entry visas are not particularly accessible. In the most part, they're just not available at all. What we also see is that we have mixed migration flows. Um, that means two things, uh, the way I understand it, is that on the same boat, you have people with different uh, migration profiles, but also individuals with, their, with mixed profiles as an individual. So you might have uh, the same person who is an asylum seeker or, or a refugee who is a trafficked person and who at the same time is smuggled, but who might also have um, other vulnerabilities, for example, disabilities, et cetera. Now, one of the interesting things when we talk about the law of the sea is that it doesn't matter what, what the person's profile, his status, et cetera, does not matter to the obligation to rescue. But unfortunately, what we also know is that when it comes to the decision of coastal states, especially, or of states generally, to allow disembarkation, it is a question that matters quite a lot, actually. Um, the other thing that we also see is that the private vessels are increasingly a key asset in maritime rescues. Increasingly, states are pulling away from maritime rescue. The number of assets out at sea is much more limited than it used to be, which means that private vessels are in the space where those rescues are needed. We also see um, 
different types of private vessels, obviously. So one distinction that we do, that I that we draw in the report is between merchant vessels and NGO vessels, and it's not so much to draw a distinction between the two, so much as that some of the considerations that we look into, such as commercial implications, primarily apply to merchant vessels rather than NGO vessels. Operationally, or, or legally at least, the, the law does not differentiate between the two. Um, when we talk about NGO vessels, what we also see is that governments are much more likely to be resistant to allowing disembarkation from those vessels. Uh, the other issue that's kind of in the background of the research is the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and I, we know this in two ways. So one is that obviously the research was carried out primarily over the course of 2020, which means that it is something that we have to think about. But we see it being relevant in this context in two ways. So one is that states are using the pretext of the COVID crisis to close ports to declare ports unsafe and to say that people cannot be disembarked. And the second is that um, that is an additional strain on private vessels because they are already dealing with, for example, difficulties in changing crew, et cetera, because of the COVID restrictions and travel restrictions associated with that. So that is very broadly the context. So, we know that there are people at sea, we know that there are private vessels at sea and that they're part of this, res uh, of this rescue context, but where does the obligation to rescue come from? Um, and I think this is possibly the only simple answer that comes out of this um, research, which is that international law very clearly establishes an obligation to rescue. We find provisions on this in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, in the Salvage Convention, in the Safety of Life at Sea Convention, in the Search and Rescue Convention, as well as in guidance by the IMO primarily, but also IMO in collaboration with others, as well as soft law instruments, but also industry practice. One of the things that we note is that um, the shipping industry has always held itself to the standard of rescuing people at sea. However, we also know that there are significant disincentives for that that come from the commercial implications and delays linked to, the, to that rescue. Now, the, there's a few obviously question marks around the obligation to rescue, and, and I think uh, Felicity will deal with some of this as well, but basically um, a few things that are clear. One is that you, uh, the shipmaster has an obligation to rescue anyone at sea, irrespective of their status. The obligation to rescue does not care whether an individual is smuggled, does not care whether an individual is documented or undocumented. There is an obligation to rescue anyone who is in distress at sea. However, the obligation to rescue is not absolute. It's not an absolute obligation. So um, masters have to make a decision very quick, very quickly. Um, very often in, in the question of minutes, they need to decide, is this rescue something that my vessel, that I can, can actually do? Is it something that is going to put my ship and my crew in danger? Um, and that is basically the, the the limitation on the obligation to rescue is if, if rescuing will put the vessel or its crew in, in, in danger. And we've seen that come up in different ways. Um, primarily, it comes up in the context of the number of people being rescued being more than the crew of a particular ship. So we also see guidance from the International Chamber of Shipping, for example, that talks about how, how do you um, assign people to different parts of the ship in order to ma maintain um, order on, on the ship. Uh, the other thing to mention is that the obligation to rescue is attributed directly to the shipmaster. Um, and actually the shipmaster's discretion is protected under international law. So not even the ship owner um, should be interfering with the shipmaster's decision in the context of rescue. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention on the obligation to rescue before I move on is that it's also established in national law and we, we map out some of the provisions in domestic law um, across different countries um, for the, the obligation to rescue. And the other thing to keep in mind is that in some context, the obligation to rescue actually comes with a criminal penalty in the case of failure to rescue under domestic law. However, the reality is that those provisions are rarely if ever um, implemented and enforced. The other thing to keep in mind is also that um, 
Criminal cl claims, as I said, are, are hard to come by. Civil claims are equally hard to come by because of the requirements that you need to establish in terms of uh, standing in a court, et cetera, to bring um, a, a successful claim. Um, and unfortunately, in the most part, if people are lost at sea, then it is very unlikely that they will be able to, that they will still be alive, but also even if they do survive, that they'd be able to, to bring a claim or that a family member will be able to bring a claim against a shipmaster um, that failed to protect them. So the other, the next thing that we do in the report is talk about, okay, so a shipmaster has an obligation to rescue, fine. What, ha what happens next? So one of the things that we see, and this is something that obviously comes up a lot in the context of the Mediterranean, but it's come up over decades in different contexts, is that basically um, you res the vessel rescues people and then it is asked to um, hold on to those people until countries decide where they're going to be disembarked. And that is where the, some of the human rights implications come in as well as the commercial implications come in. So what we do in this report, um, and as far as I know, it is largely the first time this has been done with, with some exceptions. I believe the Danish Institute, which Gabby will be talking about, did some research on this as well. But basically what we, what we try to do is to look at the second pillar of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and see how they apply in the context of search and rescue. And the obligation or the responsibility of business is to respect human rights, right? Not to violate human rights. And the, the guiding principles talk about a, a continuum of ways in which a business can be involved in human rights violations, whether they cause the violation themselves, whether they contribute to it, or are involved in it through their business relationships. In whichever one of these is the case, the obligation on business is to seize any human rights violations, prevent human rights violations, and then apply any leverage they can in the context where they are involved with um, those violations. So then the next step was, okay, so what are the human rights violations that can come into play? And there are, broadly speaking, two, uh, well, there are, there are different rights that are involved, but broadly speaking, the, the focus is on two. So the first is the right to life. And the right to life includes basically the, the obligation on, in, the, in the case of business, in the case of ships at sea, to rescue people in distress at sea. But obviously it's not only the obligation to rescue as it comes from, from the law of the sea, it's also a human rights obligation um, or a human rights responsibility under the UN guiding principles, but it's also about being prepared to rescue. And we see from the SOLAS convention, et cetera, that there should be measures put in place by businesses um, or by ships in order to make sure that they are equipped and that their staff is trained in order to rescue people in distress at sea. So that's the right, one part of the right to life. The next part is the prohibition of non-reformal. And obviously here we have the discussion around what do we mean by non-reformal? Do we only mean Article 33 of the Refugee Convention? Do we mean the prohibition of torture? Is reformal limited to the prohibition of torture? So I use the definition used by UNHCR in, in their document about non-reformal, which basically talks about return to serious human rights violations. And what, what we see is that we have a prohibition of return uh, to those conditions, whether under the Refugee Convention, under Human Rights Treaties, under the ICCPR, under the Convention Against Torture. Um, we also see instructions by states to violate those, that principle of non-reformal. So one of the things that we regularly see is states through their um, maritime rescue coordination centers, giving instructions to masters and to private vessels to return people to countries that we know to be, and they know to be unsafe. The key example is instructions given by um, MRCCs in Malta and Italy for to private vessels to return people to Libya. And I will give this by way of context of the project. The, the initial idea for the project actually started back in 2013 when Malta um, was giving instructions to a private vessel, the MT Salamis, to return people to Libya. So that's where some of these questions started coming up. Um, and it, it's something that I've been thinking about since then. And, and um, it's, it's now that it's kind of come to, to fruition in this way. 
So the question then becomes, okay, under the UN guiding principles, the vessel has these obligations, the master has these obligations. Equally, the ship owners in, in this context would also um, be brought in. How do you balance those things out? Um, and what role can the UN guiding principles, what role can human rights law, what role can the shipping industry, et cetera, play in um, advocating for a situation where those instructions are not given? And when those instructions are given, the issue becomes, okay, so you're not returning people to Libya, but we're not going to allow you to come into our harbor in order to disembark the people on board. So all of these are issues that um, come up when we read the UN guiding principles. The other things obviously that come through very clearly from the guiding principles is that it doesn't matter. The size of the business doesn't matter whether it's a massive shipping company or whether it's a small, um, you know, a, a fisherman family um, that's, that's rescuing people. They both have responsibilities with regards to human rights, obviously um, tantamount to, to the amount of leverage that they, that they can have. The other thing I wanted to mention regarding the prohibition of non of non refoulement or the prohibition of refoulement, I should say, um, is that the other uh, there, there's two other issues that come up in the context of delayed rescue. So one is the right to health. Uh, we see especially when vessels are being returned to countries like Libya, but also when when vessels are left out at sea for a long time. We, we've had media reports and other reporting about kind of the health conditions of the people on board deteriorating, both in terms of their physical health as well as their mental health. So that is another right that is at play when we talk about um, rescue at sea. And the other one is that the, the vessels are not supposed to be long-term places of safety. They are kind of a, an interim thing and so that people can then be disembarked into a place of safety. So if you leave people on board those vessels for a long time, those vessels cannot, um, cannot realistically uh, take care of the people on board and the conditions on those, on those vessels might also deteriorate to a point when we're talking about the creating conditions, et cetera. So all of these rights, rights issues come up when we see um, in the context of rescue, but also in the context of uh, delays to, to rescue or rather delays to disembarkation. So the other uh, angle that we wanted to look at is commercial implications. And the reason we wanted to look at this is because it's all well and good for us to talk about human rights obligations, human rights responsibilities, both of states, but also of, of corporations. But the decision of the master, the decision of kind of the, the shipping industry more generally is also informed by some of those commercial implications. And we know that the shipping industry involves a, a lot of money and one day of a ship being delayed is, you know, costs X amount of dollars. And that is something that is quite important to, to consider in this sort of research. And it's something that's been done only to a very limited extent um, uh, up, up to this point. So one of the things we, Kind of identified through the research is that the costs associated with return with um, sorry the costs associated with rescue can be divided broadly into direct and indirect costs direct costs are things like okay what extra fuel do i need to go from where i am now to rescue people to then the point of disembarkation and that's usually covered by p and i clubs etc the other side of it is indirect costs. What happens with, with, what are the costs associated with the fact that the ship did not get to the port where it was supposed to get on the date and at the time that it was supposed to get there, for example. So there's, those are some of the indirect costs. And in the report, we look at some of the rules on courage of goods by sea. So the Hague and hague Fisby rules, the Rotterdam rules and the Hamburg rules. And we also look at charter parties, both time charter parties and voyage charter parties. And what we see is that there are that there's kind of this distinction in, in these documents between the liberty to deviate to safe life at sea. That's fine. There's no issue there. Most of these charter parties will allow it. But then the question becomes, okay, but how do we allocate the costs of that um, of the time spent to rescue people at sea and all the additional costs that come with it? So one of the things 
um, that we, we looked at in particular is, for example, what happens in, or rather is a vessel that is under a time charter party still on hire or off hire in the context of um, a rescue and in the context of a delay linked to a rescue or a delay linked to the fact that a no uh, coastal state has allowed disembarkation. Um, and then we also looked at some of the insurance coverage and the p and clubs in particular, which is um, the most relevant in this context. And what we see there is as well, this recognition that there is this responsibility to rescue people at sea, but at the same time that, um, you know, certain costs like the direct costs are directly covered, but you should also be thinking about some of the indirect costs that come with it. And then in the last stage, we look at the role of the state. Now, obviously, if, we, if, we, if you look at literature around maritime migration, there's quite a lot of uh, focus on the responsibility of the state. And anytime private vessels come in, they come in because they are an extension of the decision of the state or, or the argument of the state. So what we did was we looked specifically at the role of the state with regards to the private vessel. So we looked at the flag states and there we see um, that the flag state has a due diligence obligation. It has a, a due diligence obligation to make sure that the vessel is actually obliged to rescue, to make sure that it has legislation that requires rescue of people at sea, that it monitors that obligation, for example, but also that ships are adequately equipped. So when you're doing licensing, et cetera, vessels, making sure that they are duly equipped in order to deal with rescue operations. The other way that flag states have come up in discussions recently, and, and you know, we'll, we'll, we can ask, we'll discuss this in a bit more detail in our um, discussion, is whether there's any role for flag states in terms of disembarkation. So usually the assumption is coastal states will, will cooperate in order to allow disembarkation. But there has been an argument being made, especially by coastal states, um, unsurprisingly, that flag states should also take um, their own respons their responsibility. And I think one of the arguments that's usually made is that, oh, you know, flag states are usually so far away that it, it's not feasible for them to be involved in disembarkation. But I think we can also think about ways in which people can be disembarked in one country under the responsibility of another and then can be um, moved to a different country in this case, where it would be the flag state. So that's the flag state. We then also look at the coastal state. Um, and with the coastal state, there's two sides of it. So the first one is this issue of delay of disembarkation, right? So the coastal state has an obligation, coastal state and the search and rescue state have an obligation of cooperation and coordination to allow the prompt disembarkation of people. The general, the general idea is that um, states should cooperate between themselves in order to make sure that the master of a vessel or the vessel is not delayed in disembarking the people that it has rescued. We see this obviously not working in, in many cases. So we, we see, we start the report actually with the, with the example of the Maersk Etienne that had people on board for over 30 days, over a month, um, because countries just couldn't agree on who was going to disembark people. Now, international law does not provide a default state of disembarkation. Um, so it, the obligation is only to cooperate and coordinate in that context. And it's the responsibility of the SAR state to make sure that that cooperation and coordination actually happens. Um, but the other issue that comes up a lot is the role of the coastal states with regards to human rights. Um, and here again, we see the question of conditions on board if there is delayed disembarkation that I mentioned earlier, but also this idea of instructions to return. Um, so we've seen a lot of cases where Italy, Malta, and many other countries have given instructions to vessels to return to countries like Libya. And there, the, um, we look at the articles of the ILC articles on state responsibility, and it's clear from those articles, to our mind at least, that there is a there is responsibility first directly for the instruction because the instruction itself is a wrongful act, given knowledge of um, knowledge or um, what the state ought to have known about the countries to which these uh, persons are being returned and through the um, instruction to the private vessels, then there is also such responsibility that comes up in that context. 
And I've already discussed the question of disembarkation. And then eventually, towards the end of the report, we come up with a number of recommendations, including the need for an integrated approach, which is based on the good faith efforts of all involved, the need to clarify and formalize rules for disembarkation, avoid using disembarkation as a lobbying tactic. And again, you know, using thinking about the example of the Mediterranean, one of the things we've seen is that people being left on vessels has been used by countries to push the European Union, to push other member states to um, share, to take responsibility for the people on board that vessel and to share solidarity more broadly. Um, obviously, states need to abide by their obligation to assist masters in reducing delays to um, journeys as much as possible. But again, the, the counter side to that is this question of solidarity between member states um, or between states in terms of responsibility for the people who have been rescued. We also look at the uh, industry bodies, but also kind of the, the industry, the shipping industry more broadly to use its bargaining power with states, both flex states as well as coastal states. Um, and the industry bodies to also think of model clauses that clarify the sharing of risk. One of the things that we, we identify is that when, when you know who is going to be responsible, then there are ways of ensuring against that risk, etc. So clarification of the responsibility, and we've seen some attempts at this in, in some places, clarifying who is going to be responsible, what is going, to, when a ship is going to be on hire, off hire, etc., and therefore who is paying, is the charterer paying um, the hire fee, etc. All of that, clarifying all of that and clarifying who is going to be responsible is critically important. And the other thing we thought of is this idea of um, developing a way for sharing of some of the costs associated with research. And um, there are models out there around kind of compensation fund in the context of um, oil leaks from vessels, for example, um, that could be looked at as examples of this. Um, in terms of research, um, one of the things that we identified is the need to facilitate access to information about decisions. Um, many of the, these issues come up in kind of arbitrations, which are often um, behind closed doors and not published. Um, clear, uh, facilitating access to that information would allow greater analysis from different places. And the other, um, the final recommendation also related to kind of research, but also the more the broader kind of policy analysis is the mainstreaming of business and human rights in shipping and the mainstreaming of shipping in business and human rights. Um, one of the things that we noticed is that there's very little analysis of the way the UN guiding principles, for example, apply to the shipping industry. Um, so, yeah, so that is our final recommendation. Um, and I think that brings me to the end of what I had to say, but I'm obviously happy to answer any questions. Um, but before we do that, I would like to give the word to uh, Felicity, who will be talking about the perspective of the shipmaster. Okay, so thank you very much, John, for that excellent presentation. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so first of all, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are tuning in from. Let me start by saying how honoured I am to be addressing you today, along with my very um, esteemed colleagues on this panel. I would like to thank Bigel and Jean for organising this event and for kindly asking me to talk to you today. And I'd also like to express my gratitude to the Mipuri Foundation for funding research on a topic of great importance and one which has remained very close to my heart over the last few years. So my intervention today will address an important individual, an often unsung hero in search and rescue operations, and this is the ship um, shipmaster of merchant vessels. So I will look at his or her role in fulfilling states ob international obligations in the rendering of assistance at sea. And I hope that my brief presentation today will also draw attention to some of the challenges which the shipmaster and crew of merchant vessels face 
when asked to rescue migrants and refugees at sea. So as um, was excellently explained in the report and also by Jeanne, the duty to render assistance at sea, this is a long-standing rule of international law and really at the core of this obligation is the need to protect life at sea. It emerges from treaty law, general international law, and has also been elaborated on in various um, non-binding instruments. However, the duty has developed over time. It has had to respond and adapt to um, contemporary circumstances and realities posed by mass migration by sea. And today, I would like to pose two questions, which were briefly um, addressed by John as well for us to think about. And that is first, who is the subject of this duty? And secondly, is this duty absolute? And in order to answer these questions, I think we'd have to refer to what is considered to be the cornerstone of the international regime regulating the duty to render assistance. And that is Article 98 of UNCLOS. So Article 98 of UNCLOS tells us that flag states should require their shipmasters to provide assistance, to provide rescue to, the, to persons in distress. So the subject of the duty is in fact the shipmaster and under international law, the duty to render assistance is personally attributed to the shipmaster. And I think John mentioned this as well. In some treaties like SOLAS, he is addressed directly. So states depend on this individual to or, or for the effective implementation of their international obligations to render assistance at sea. And then with respect to the second question, is the duty absolute? If we look at the wording of UNCLOS, we'll see that the duty is qualified insofar as the shipmaster can provide this assistance without serious danger to his ship, crew or passenger, and insofar as such action may be reasonably expected of him. So in fact, the duty is not absolute and it was never considered to be so even in its very early stages of development. So the rules we see before us here in Article 98 are actually inherited from the 1958 Geneva Convention on the High Seas, which were in turn inspired by much um, rules found in much earlier treaties. So the question arises now it, is that whether the rules we find in Article 98 are adequate to deal with contemporary um, challenges and problems we are facing with mass migration by sea. They were drafted in a very different time to cater for, you know, the typical shipwreck scenario involving seafarers. And another issue um, with 98 is whilst the duty is qualified insofar as the shipmaster can do so without causing serious danger to ship crew passengers, UNCLOS does not, or UNCLOS or any other treaties, they do not provide a measure for the seriousness um, of the danger. So this seems to be a matter which is left to the discretion of the shipmaster and he, can, he or she can be expected to then exercise their professional judgment in light of the circumstances of the rescue operation. Not always an easy job. Indeed, um, the shipmaster is often faced with the burdensome task of balancing his duties towards persons in distress with those towards the safety of his um, crew, his ship crew and passengers. And this delicate balance um, is even more pronounced in light of the migration by sea crisis and the challenges it brings about. And before I um, discuss these challenges um, briefly, 
I would like to share with you a short, but I think very effective clip, which shows assistance being rendered in practice. So this is footage um, recorded by crew members of a merchant vessel, the MV Zeran. Um, it was released by the Associated Press a couple of years back. Um, and um, I think it's quite effective, so I'll play it now. Okay. So something that really um, strikes me about this video is really the sheer panic out at sea um, on the part of the migrants who have been on, on their vessel for no, who knows how long, but also panic on the side of the shipmaster and the crew when trying to conduct this operation. So yes, there are a number of um, safe, there are a number of different challenges um, posed by these top types of operations. So we have safety and security challenges, we have commercial challenges, we also have human rights and refugee rights considerations. And if we look at some of these challenges in a little more detail, some of the safety and security challenges which the shipmaster and his or her crew face. Um, as Jean explained earlier, these types of vessels, merchant vessels, are typically manned by a very small crew of around 20 to 30 persons. So it is often the case that the number of persons in distress outnumbers the crew. And this can create great challenges, okay, in when trying to ensure safe and swift rescues. Commercial vessels not designed to um, carry out rescue operations. So it can prove very challenging to bring on board a large group of persons from a very small vessel onto a ship the size of a large building in very perilous weather conditions. And it's often the case that the shipmaster and crew, they risk their own lives in these type of operations. Um, and seafarers um, and the shipmaster, they are rarely trained, nor physically nor psychologically to carry out these type of operations, which sometimes can take days to be completed. So the toll on um, uh, a crew can be quite significant. Once individuals are brought on board, um, there are other um, health and safety concerns. There may be exposure to diseases and virus. So this was quite a concern in the um, West Africa Ebola crisis, but of course also now during the current pandemic. Another issue um, relates to security. Now, whilst it is um, very difficult to know exactly what goes on out at sea, there have been reports um, from the shipmaster and crew of vessels that um, certain rescuees have become aggressive towards them. This, was, this is something which happened during the Tampa incident, but more recently during the MV Marina rescue, which happened in May of this year during the lockdown months, where both Malta and Italy declared their ports unsafe to receive uh, migrants. And there are also concerns for the rescued individuals themselves. So apart from this very risky 
embarkation procedure. Um, these types of vessels rarely have enough um, provisions to accommodate large groups of individuals on board and they very rarely have resources to um, address urgent medical needs. And having such large groups of individuals on board um, may make it difficult for the shipmaster to maintain law and order on board, to monitor the movements of um, all the rescuees, to make sure that individuals do not um, wander off to restricted areas of the ship and accidentally uh, cause damage to the cargo or the vessel itself. And as John mentioned, of course, there are commercial challenges. The shipmaster will be aware of the uh, commercial challenges underlying a rescue at sea operation of this nature, um, including the costs and risks involved. The problem here is that these rescues are of such an urgent nature that they often leave very little time for the shipmaster to consider these issues. And um, indeed, it may be argued that in the overwhelming, uh, in the face of the overwhelming need to protect life at sea, these commercial considerations um, should play a subsidiary role and will often be dealt with post rescue. But of course, they remain um, a very important uh, problem for the shipping industry. As John said, um, insurance, so vessels insurance policies cover some limited expenses, um, which he mentioned, so um, extra fuel wages but they do not cover the loss of profit as a result of the delay, which is generally due to the reluctance or the inability of states to agree on a place for disembarkation. And the cost of this delay can run into thousands of, of dollars. There is also uncertainty as to who should bear the cost, whether it be the ship owner or the charterer. And um, many a time this will depend on underlying shipping contracts, which um, many of which do not have specific clauses um, addressing who should bear the costs um, in these types of rescue operations. And the challenges I mentioned earlier are really um, also further complicated by the shipmaster's responsibilities to, res to um, protect and to respect the fundamental human rights of both his rescuees and his crew. So the shipmaster should really act as the guardian of human rights throughout the rescue operation. He should treat um, his rescuees with humanity, again, within the capabilities of his ship. Not an easy task, especially if the shipmaster has to accommodate hundreds of rescuees and provide them with food, water and, and medical supplies. And there may also be individuals brought on board who are entitled to additional protections under refugee law. So whilst it's generally accepted that the shipmaster has no responsibility in determining the status of his um, rescuees, if there is an individual who expresses a fear to his or her life as a result of being disembarked in a particular place, and even if they do not, but the shipmaster is aware that the place um, instructed for disembarkation is not a place of safety, then he or she should uphold fundamental principles of refugee law, like non refoulement which was mentioned earlier. There have been some positive developments over the years, in particular the 2004 amendments to the SOLAS and SAR convention, which were aimed at strengthening cooperation between states um, in assisting the shipmaster in these types of operations. So all states have a responsibility uh, 
according under the amendments to um, ensure that the shipmaster is not um, burdened with unnecessary deviation or delay. And then the stricter obligation falls on the state responsible for the search and rescue region where assistance is rendered. So these states have a primary responsibility for ensuring that um, persons embarked are then disembarked to a place of safety as soon as reasonably practicable. However, um, the, whilst they, the amendments were a positive development, their approach to disembarkation remains somewhat controversial. Um, some states interpret um, this provision to, or the primary responsibility to imply or to impose a residual obligation on the SAR state to allow uh, um, rescuees into their own territory if all other efforts to find a place of safety elsewhere have been exhausted. Not all states have accepted the amendments. Malta has persistently objected to them. So to conclude, um, in the face of frequent uh, distress at sea situations, um, in, the, in the face of um, mass migration by sea, I think that the legal rules or, um, that we see promo, uh, provide, I think, a certain amount of stability, but it's difficult, or at least for me to argue, that they provide comprehensive solutions to the problems that we are facing. And this does not really augur well for the implementation of the duty to render assistance. If we have to just oppose uh, two incidents, almost two decades apart, so the MV Tampa, which took eight days to be resolved, and the recent, more recent Mersk Etienne um, uh, incident, which took a historic 38 days to be resolved. So ironically, despite the 2004 amendments, the latter case took longer to be resolved, and when you consider the length of time um, that it took for the uh, Tian Musk case to be resolved, one wonders whether uh, the legal remedies uh, provided, uh, the protection to the shipmaster is adequate. Despite the amendments, the shipmaster still faces various problems. And therefore, the question arises, is it time for the international community to reconsider rules which grant more protection to the shipmaster and rescuees um, in these types of situations? And I think that my time is up, but I definitely look forward to discussing these questions later on with our participants. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Felicity. Um, I think a number of things that you highlighted are, are critically important. And one of those is the, the question of training for um, crew members and, and masters and crew members um, and the support that they ought to be given um, both for the rescue, but also after the rescue and the, the potential trauma associated with being involved in those sorts of situations. Um, this is something that the uh, Chamber of Shipping uh, guidance does mention, but unfortunately we don't see as much of that coming through through the legal framework. Um, the other thing uh, that I wanted to kind of come back to is this idea of the master's responsibility in terms of determining status and, and that he's not responsible for determining status. And I think that is critically important to, to underline. Um, and one of the things that we've seen is that when people uh, have, have been charged with crimes committed on board vessels in, and we've seen a number of cases come through in Italy, for example, um, the, they've invariably been found to be um, cases done in self-defense. Um, and, and that is kind of partly those courts recognizing also that returns to countries like Libya, et cetera, are particularly unsafe. So, um, with 
having said that, I'll turn to Gabby, who will be talking about the business and human rights angle. Um, Gabby, I think you will also be sharing some slides. Yes, I'll do so right now. Okay, perfect. So I think I wanted to start um, by saying a huge congratulations to you, Jean-Pierre, and to the team at Bickle who've worked on this report. Um, I think that it's, um, it's it's really pleasing to me to see this report finally come to fruition after a number of years. Uh, it was sort of, it had its inception in the time that I was at Bickle. And so um, on a personal note, it's really lovely to see it, it come out into the world now. And I, I echo Felicity's Thanks to the Mipiru Foundation for funding, I think, what I think is very timely and very on point research. So I think it's it's not just on a personal level that I, I think it's wonderful this report has come into the world, but, but also uh, I think it fills a real gap in the literature. I think that the consideration of the business nexus to international law obligations that are enlivened when private vessels rescue migrants is really under considered and under research, both in the discipline of business and human rights, where I kind of, uh, where I sit, and I think in other aspects of international law, but also really under considered by the shipping industry itself. So I think this is a very timely intervention. So uh, thank you for the report. And I think that this, uh, the lack of consideration of this issue is particularly problematic given the severity of the potential impacts on rights holders. Um, where, for example, the principle of non fulmont is, is breached. And um, as I'll get into um, in the course of this presentation, um, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, which are the, the kind of touchstone for uh, understanding business obligations with respect to human rights, um, really do require businesses to prioritize the action they take on human rights using the principle of severity and considering the, um, the extraordinary severity uh, of potential risks to rights holders that can arise when um, when uh, particularly the principle of norm for moments breach. Um, I think it's it's uh, extraordinary that this issue hasn't been given more consideration. So as this research points out, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights can provide a, a very useful framework to help clarify the responsibilities or the, the duties and responsibilities of, of state and business actors in relation to this issue. Um, so my expertise is in, in business and human rights. So as, um, as Jean-Pierre mentioned, I'll be speaking to the business and human rights aspects um, in the course of this discussion. And the value of the UN guiding principles, um, both as an analytical framework um, to, to understand these issues and also as a, as a guidance document um, for businesses as they navigate these, these issues. Um, so I wanted to begin just by um, highlighting a report that was released this year by the Danish Institute with, um, with Danish shipping. Um, I just, at the outset, I didn't work on this report. It was uh, all, uh, research was all done and completed before I joined the Institute, but I've spoken with colleagues who were working on it. And as they were uh, undertaking the research, they um, found it really difficult to find material which considered human rights issues in the context of the shipping industry. That was, uh, was a real kind of um, under-considered issue. And they also found there was a really a low penetration of the, of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights in the shipping industry as well. And, you know, this is a very, a very challenging and fragmented industry and one that I think is at the very beginning of its human rights journey. But having said that, there are some human rights issues that are often considered in the business and human rights context by the shipping industry. Um, and where they are considered in shipping, um, I think that they're often, uh, the considerations often confined to consideration of uh, labor conditions for seafarers and workers um, on ships and in ports, um, the conditions of workers in the shipbuilding industry and at end of life and decommissioning, and some consideration of human rights issues in the supply chain. Um, for the shipping industry as well, but very, very little consideration given to obligations in the context of search and rescue um, concerning right to life and, and non-reformant, um, despite the severity of these um, potential human rights impacts. 
and you know, and fair enough to be considering the labor conditions on boats. There are some horrific stories about um, forced and bonded labor, about working hours, about occupational health and safety for workers on board ships and, and in other contexts associated with the shipping industry. But uh, I think that the, the issue that we're considering um, today and, and is considered in depth in this report is, um, is one that has sort of potentially very severe human rights impacts and is equally worthy of consideration um, by the shipping industry itself. So um, this is uh, just pulled very uh, quickly from the, um, the Danish shipping report that I mentioned earlier. So that report considers a broad range of different human rights impacts, um, but it does very briefly consider search and rescue, but again, very briefly. Um, and I think that my, my colleagues who were working on this section in particular found virtually no literature, I think, on this particular issue. So again, a very timely intervention. So I might uh, turn in a moment to, to speak to, I think the, the UN guiding principles, their structure and, and why I think that they are a very useful analytical framework to be considering these issues and uh, which is I think elaborated very well in the report. So uh, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, um, again, they are kind of the authoritative standard uh, for, for those working in the business and human rights space. Um, they were unanimously adopted by the Human Rights Council 10 years ago, so they're having their anniversary next year. Um, they are a soft law instrument, uh, which does not create new international law obligations, but rather they restate the existing international law obligations of states and set out a number of what are termed responsibilities of business actors. And then also considers the, the shared role that both of those actors have in relation to the provision of access to effective remedy. So uh, it's structured in a sort of tripartite uh, format. So there are three what are termed pillars um, in, the, in the UN guiding principle, principles. Um, the first considers um, the state duty to protect. Um, and uh, I think as with all things in international law, the, the primary duties in relation to these issues are borne by the state. Um, the, the UN guiding principles don't purport to, um, to create any uh, direct obligations on business actors through the instrument. Um, it very much restates what are existing international law obligations on states to, to protect human rights. and. Um, the, this is essentially discharged under the UN guiding principles um, by the um, enactment and enforcement of effective policies, legislation, regulation, and adjudication of, of business impacts on human rights. Um, the second pillar, which I think is, is the one that um, has uh, the greatest focus in, in the report, um, and rightly so, um, is pillar two, which considers uh, the corporate responsibility to respect um, here, the word responsibility is, is quite deliberately used um, by John Rocky, who is the architect of the UN Guiding Principles, um, to distinguish um, the, uh, the role of business and the kind of the existing international law duties of states. So the corporate responsibility is something that falls short um, of, a, of a legal obligation, but um, arguably, you know, is, is more than a mere moral obligation. Like it's, it has a sort of it's slightly um, ambiguous status, I think, and there's been some literature about um, uh, just like slightly decrying the kind of ambiguity in the use of the term responsibility. But um, in, in essence, um, it's a responsibility of business not to cause or contribute um, what are termed human rights impacts. And um, you know, for better or worse, um, the in an effort to kind of reach across the aisle, as it were, um, the UN guiding principles um, has sort of translated human rights concepts and terminology into the language of business. So where we might expect to, to read about human rights violations or human rights abuses, we instead find language of um, adverse human rights impact. Uh, so the responsibility is to um, not to cause or contribute to adverse human rights impacts. And in cases where a business is linked to an adverse human rights impact, they are required to use their leverage to mitigate that impact. Um, now, the UN Guiding Principles provides a bit of clarity to business on how they might go about this. So um, it contains um, uh, a process that's uh, termed human rights due diligence. And I'll, I'll get into that in, in a moment in a subsequent slide, but it's essentially a process for businesses to um, identify, uh, address and kind of act on uh, the human rights risks that they find. 
it applies, as, as Jean-Pierre have uh, noted earlier, it applies to all companies regardless of size. So in this case, it applies to vessels large and small, um, but the, the framework is a very uh, pragmatic document. So it, it accepts that businesses um, can't act on all of their human rights impacts all at once. Um, and indeed businesses like small and medium enterprises um, can't be expected to, think, to act in the same way as a multinational corporation. So it uses, it accepts that the businesses can prioritize the action they take on certain human rights risks that they encounter and that's again, as I mentioned earlier, based on the principle of severity. So not based on likelihood of a risk arising, but rather based on the severity of the potential human rights impact. So in this case, although um, a migrant rescue may not be um, routine or something that happens um, as a matter of course, or be particularly likely, although as we've seen with the kind of escalating number of um, attempts to cross the Mediterranean, maybe that is becoming more likely over time. Um, it's not the likelihood of the risk that, that requires um, an actor to act, but rather the severity. Um, and responsibility, as I mentioned, is not analogous to a legal duty, but it is being gradually codified um, in national laws. There's um, a quite a well-advanced movement at the EU level to introduce um, mandatory human rights due diligence obligations, which um, may change the space and would apply um, uh, if the current thinking is uh, is correct that the EU measure will likely be cross-sectoral and apply to all businesses um, based in the EU or providing services um, or goods to the single market. So um, it may be that any future EU level mandatory human rights due diligence obligation could become quite relevant in this space. Um, the UN guiding principles are also the basis of the current negotiations around a treaty on business and human rights. So it, that I think is, is still quite a long way off, but um, we may well see um, a new international instrument in this in this space, which does itself um, uh, impose uh, kind of uh, new or uh, or clarified international law obligations. Um, just to give a very quick shout out to Bickel as well, who's uh, recently did some research for the EU that is um, very much informing and shaping the um, the nature of that new EU measure as well. Um, and then the pillar three um, concerns access to remedy, and that's um, a shared responsibility of, of both businesses and state actors um, that can take the form of judicial remedy, non-judicial remedy, or um, a, uh, an operational level grievance mechanism that a business creates. So using this sort of tripartite structure, the UNGP set out the respective roles of state and business. And considering the sort of the, the murky and rather intertwined um, nature of the obligations, international law obligations that we're thinking about in this context, um, I think that the UN guiding principles can provide some much needed clarity and structure on the respective obligations of the various actors. So with respect to search and rescue, um, as I mentioned, um, the, the primary duties under the UNGPs um, uh, are borne by the state and this, this doesn't change um, in this context. So um, here, the primary duties remain with the state, but under the UNGPs, um, businesses, there's the business responsibility to avoid causing or contributing um, or to use leverage where, where a business is linked to a human rights abuse um, it exists even where a state fails to uphold its obligations. So these are parallel obligations and they exist regardless of state action. Um, in the shipping context and in the context of um, rescue of, of, of migrant boats, it's, it's unlikely that the, uh, the ship would be involved in um, causing a human rights harm, but I think that there's a very real argument that it could contribute to a human rights harm. So by cooperating with a direction to return a migrant boat to where it came from could contribute to a harm arising from a breach of the state obligation regarding non Um So in terms of what a business is required to do, um, I mentioned earlier that the UN guiding principle sets out um, a number of uh, steps that businesses can take in order to, to discharge the responsibility under the UNGPs. And um, the primary process by which they do this is a process of human rights due diligence. And it's a, a means by which um, businesses can identify and address their adverse human rights impacts. So it, it draws from principles of corporate due diligence, but the focus is on risks to right holders, not to the company. So it differs quite significantly from materiality analysis company, commonly used by companies to assess risks to the business. 
Um, there are a number of components here. There are four stages of the due diligence process itself. So there is um, assessing and identifying impacts, then taking steps to act upon those impacts to address them, uh, then tracking and monitoring, and then communications. And these steps in this diagram are, I think, deliberately not numbered because this is very much a kind of cyclical ongoing process. It's not a typical due diligence process by which you can do it once and then forget, um, and then it's, it's done. Um, there's also a requirement on companies to um, put in place a policy commitment. Um, and what I think the, one of the interesting aspects of the report is there's some analysis that um, has been done of the policies of some of the larger shipping companies. And it found that although there are commitments to human rights, whether in a kind of standalone human rights policy or buried in the bowels of a business ethics policy, um, and in some cases, acknowledgement of specific impacts such as child labor or forced labor, none of the policies specifically considered obligations regarding search and rescue. And um, Jean-Pierre, um, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, my impression from the report is that you found no other disclosures really from the companies in question identifying this, this is a risk issue. And, um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, I think there is a real um, issue here because if we're thinking, if guided by the UN guiding principles, severity is, is the principle by which companies are required to prioritize the action they take on risks and the severity of the human rights impact in these cases is incredibly high. The fact that no companies are um, disclosing um, the action they're taking on this issue or the flagging it as a, as a particularly salient risk issue um, really raises questions on whether these companies are undertaking appropriate due diligence, are effectively mapping out all their human rights concerns um, and specifically whether they are prepared for, for risks arising from potential infringements on the rights of refugees and migrants, as the report correctly points out. Um, we also touched on the idea that there may be conflicts between uh, instructions given to, uh, to a master and, um, and the requirements of international human rights law. Um, and again, here, the UN guiding principles um, are a useful framework and provide some guidance. So here, guiding principle 23 um, considers um, potential conflicts between international human rights standards and national laws or, or others. And um, again, here, um, Bickle has produced some quite useful uh, guidance materials for businesses, which um, uh, creates a kind of taxonomy of the kind of conflicts that can arise um, and provides some guidance to business um, in, in navigating these conflicts. And these conflicts can be complex um, as the report highlights, you know, yeah, masters receive instructions of where to return rescued migrants. These may conflict with international human rights principles. Um, and vessels which are, are likely to find themselves in these situations need to be um, prepared and be re uh, for that eventuality and, and have appropriate guidance. And I think that um, guiding principle 23 is, is a good starting point here, but um, businesses themselves really do need to um, prepare guidance for, um, I think, their masters to, to, of what to do in the case of a conflict. And this is a, a fairly critical issue that I think has, um, again, not been given a great deal of consideration. Um, and the big research I, I mentioned here is, is quite useful in navigating that. Sorry, um, you Yes. I'm sorry. just conscious of time is the only... All oh, right, sorry, I, I'm just about to finish. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so I just wanted to, to flag a couple of the recommendations in the report. Um, I think that um, I, and I'm, which I, with which I'm completely agreed, I think there is a need for an integrated approach that recognizes the role of state actors and the commercial players involved. And I think that, you know, the, the structure of the UNGPs and the guidance it gives to kind of state and, non, and business actors can be a useful framework to do this. So I, again, I, um, I completely endorse the recommendation that business and human rights should be mainstreamed in the, in the shipping industry, because I think as we've discussed during the course of the presentation, this is a, it's a useful framework um, through which to, to analyze these issues. Thank you very much, Gabby. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm aware that uh, we're running a little bit out of time, so I might just ask participants to hang on with us for a few extra minutes, but I want to just go directly to um, Irini's um, contribution before we take some of the questions. Um, and, you know, we, we will also have the opportunity to answer some of the questions in writing after if we don't have time to address them all. But um, Irini, over to you. <laughs> 
Uh, you're still muted. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Pierre, for the invitation. Uh, I have to start by a brief but heartfelt thanks uh, to BICOL for organizing this event and to the Mirpuri Foundation for funding such uh, an interesting project. Uh, I think it will be very brief. I don't have slides, um, so I will just provide um, a few comments uh, that are linked to the report. Uh, so as to maybe start a contribution towards discussion. Now, I think that this is a very timely report and it is actually one of the elements that show how attention for the protection of human rights at sea is increasing in the international community. This is something that was essentially entirely unknown 10 years ago. It is a field of study that started slowly first with piracy of the coast of Somalia and uh, efforts to identify the rights of pirates but also of their victims. And then it has received a boost uh, from irregular migration in the Mediterranean Sea and all the human rights issues that are linked with this. Uh, of course, uh, protection of uh, human rights of the people who are at sea goes uh, beyond uh, simply issues of piracy or migration or any specific issue and embraces any aspect of uh, any aspect linked to the presence of people at sea. But certainly the duty to rescue is fundamental in this respect. Um, it is a centuries old duty. It is a duty that has always been there. It is a duty that as Felicity showed is generally complied by, by the people who are at sea. In the first place, the masters of commercial vessels. Uh, we do know there have been some exceptions, but they still remain exceptions. Uh, so in this respect, um, the excellent job carried out by Jean-Pierre to enlighten a crucial yet little research aspect of this duty is very important because the duty has been out there for a long time, but there are still aspects which are not entirely clear. And this is particularly true for the role of private actors. Now, this is an issue that goes beyond the duty to rescue, beyond the protection of people at sea, the role of private actors is something that uh, is discussed under many different fields of international law, but it is rare to see this applied so specifically to a topic that is currently of great interest to states. So if we consider the duty to rescue as the other face of the right to life, we see there are many similarities both tend to protect uh, maybe the most important interest of every individual, that is life. Without life, an individual does not exist, and people who are at sea may die very quickly. So they need to be rescued. They need to be rescued as soon as possible. They need to be rescued without any consideration, as Jean-Pierre Felicity pointed out, for who these people are, why they are at sea, what they are doing there, and so on. But we also know that um, all these questions will kick in later on when disembarkation is discussed by states. But remaining for a moment um, on the link between the duty to rest and the right to life, I think that uh, whilst they may be seen as uh, the two different faces of the same coin, there are also some differences. And the main difference um, is that uh, probably the duty to rescue as uh, codified in the law of the sea in all the instruments uh, Jean-Pierre and Felicity illustrated goes beyond the right to life as codified in human rights instruments. Why? Because the right to life uh, can be claimed against states. So in all human rights instruments, uh, we have state duties towards individuals uh, to grant the right to life. But actually, we have seen very clearly that the duty to rescue binds not only states, but also other private actors of international law. The master of the vessel in the first place. But one could also argue, as Gabriel illustrated, that there may be other actors bound by this duty to rescue. Companies, shipping companies might be considered as bound because this is part of the rights that they need to comply with. So in this case, of course, the link between the state and the private actor is a link evidenced by the obligation of due diligence, which is very clearly illustrated by Jean-Pierre in his report. 
So the duty of the state to rescue is not the only a duty of the state to rescue itself, the people who are in distress at sea, so as uh, to use its uh, warships, uh, but also to use its search and rescue systems. It is also the duty of the state to make everything possible to make sure that other actors rescue as well. And in this respect, uh, let me recall that as the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, in particular the Seabed District Chamber has said, a duty of due diligence is not an obligation to achieve in each and every case the result envisaged by the norm, but rather it is an obligation to deploy adequate means to exercise best possible efforts to do the utmost to obtain this result. And in this respect, judges have identified a certain number of actions that are relevant in assessing compliance with the due diligence obligation, including the due diligence obligation of ensuring rescue for every person who is in distress at sea. They include the adoption of laws and regulations, the taking of administrative measures, the exercise of a certain level of vigilance in their enforcement and the exercise of administrative control, the enactment of enforcement measures, including judicial proceedings, the creation of monitoring mechanisms, the investigation of any alleged violation, and finally, but most importantly, the provision for sanctions sufficient to deter violations and to deprive offenders of the benefits accruing from their illegal activities. So we have a roadmap for states who want to comply with this duty, and we have a roadmap also for private actors because they are affected by these due diligence duties of states. So if we consider, again, the link between the duty to rescue as a duty of states, but also of other private actors and the right to life of the people involved, we see that um, this can be transposed also to other obligations. In particular, we see that the, the duty to rescue as applied to private actors actually transposes to the level of private actors also other duties that have traditionally been associated with the state. And as the report clearly points out, one of the most important such duties is the duty of non repulman non repulman has traditionally been linked to state activity. It is states that traditionally has been considered as under the obligation not to repulay. But actually we see that thanks to the intercession of the duty to rescue, no repulman now applies also to private actors. And I think this is a very welcome development. So I will now conclude these very brief remarks by two general conclusions. In the first place, I think that the contribution of international law to the protection of people at sea, including those in the most desperate conditions, such as people who are in distress and risk dying, drowning any time, goes beyond providing for duties of states. And it also includes uh, some duties that are directly applicable to private actors. And this is a contribution both to the protection of people at sea and to the development of general international law, if we want. And uh, as a second conclusion, I would like to say that uh, it is the role of research uh, to clarify the link between state duties, the duties of private individuals, and the role that, on one hand, states uh, may exercise in making private actors comply with their duties, but also the role of private actors in making states comply with their own duties, as we have seen in the case of NGO vessels. <coughs> The report that brings clarity to some of these aspects. And in this respect, I think we should welcome it very much and be happy that it is now released. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Irini. Um, and thank you also for the comments about the report. Um, I, I think this idea of linking rescue as an element of the right to life is critically important and cuts across the report, both in terms of what the law of the sea obligations are but also what the human rights obligations are and this link of the state duty as exercised to private vessels, I think is critically important. And the other issue that I think cuts across as well is this idea of due diligence and what do we mean by that due diligence? And obviously 
what the what ITLOS mentioned in terms of due diligence in the IUU fishing um, decision, which Felicity um, referred referred me to, um, is one element of due diligence. Whilst the due diligence obligations under the UN guiding principles, for example, is a little bit different, but at the same time, we are kind of moving towards this the same uh, destination or, or in the same direction. Um, so let me just take the last few minutes to take some of the questions that we've received to the Q&A function. Um, and I'll, I'll summarize some of them and then I'll, I'll open up the, the conversation for answers. So the first one is what are some of the legal ways that have been used to challenge legal instructions by states to vessels in terms of rescue? Um, and the other question is the question of port state control and the idea of states penalizing uh, private vessels, um, criminalizing masters, including in some cases on, on grounds of classification of a vessel when the classification that's being sought it doesn't actually exist um, in, in the most part. Um, and this is primarily related to the NGO rescue uh, context. Um, another question that's come up is, is it reasonable to um, apply the UN guiding principles in this context, given that we're talking about context where uh, it, we're not talking about commercial context, but rather a context where ships are involved in a way that is ancillary to their main work, just because they happen to be at sea. Um, and then another question that came in, and I'll kind of go back to uh, to the question to be to be precise, is this idea of is it generally understood that a place of safety cannot be on board a vessel, basically, that you do need to allow disembarkation in country? Um, and I'm very tempted to start answering those myself. So I'm going to um, shut up for a little bit and start maybe with Felicity, if you want to take some yeah, of the questions. There are, yeah, there are a couple of questions. Um, the one posed um, by Mr. Rossi uh, about well, he asked, is it generally understood that a place of safety under the SAR Convention excludes an arrangement where migrants are placed on board a vessel as opposed to being brought on shore? And in fact, there is guidance. Um, so there were guidelines adopted with the 2004 amendments to SOLA and SAR, which clarify that um, the vessel is only considered to be a temporary place of safety, even if it has the capabilities um, to, to accommodate those persons on board, but it is only temporary and yes, they should be disembarked to a place of safety on shore. And that answers, I hope yeah. that answers the question. Yeah, um, I think it does. And I think the other thing I was thinking in, in, on the same question is the decision in Hirsi, where yeah. the Court of Human Rights essentially said you know, there are certain kind of positive obligations that come out of the prohibition of reformant that also, the court doesn't say it, but um, Judge Albuquerque says it in his concurring opinion. Yeah. Essentially, you, you require disembarkation. Um, Gabby, I don't know whether you want to take the question of um, should we apply the UNGPs in this context? Yeah, certainly. Um, and it's, it's a very good question. Um, uh, the UNGPs uh, don't make that distinction. So um, what they what they do say is that businesses have responsibilities to um, to take action in relation to uh, human rights impacts that they cause or contribute to. So arguably, I think a, um, uh, a a ship involved in a kind of search and rescue, even if it is um, as the the the, um, the intervener has, has has said, an inter incidental obligation arising from operating at sea. Um, I, I think that they can still nonetheless contribute to a human rights impact um, or, be, or be linked to it. So I think that the UNGPs don't really make a distinction between um, uh, a, an impact that is carried out in the, in the, during the course of core business activities or, or not in the course of core business activities, but rather it's, it's any impact that the business may be involved in and that the categories involved are kind of set out there. So I would say, yes, it is reasonable to apply the UNGP. Um, uh, it's a useful kind of uh, it's a useful framework to to enable businesses to understand the ways in which they may be involved in human rights impact, and that requires, I think, thinking a little more laterally than just thinking about what uh, what impacts your core business activities may have. 
Rigney, I wonder whether you want to take the question of what legal ways have been used to challenge illegal instructions or instructions to return people to, to Libya. Well, actually, um, the root of domestic wars has been used. Eh? And uh, this has been uh, very much the case in Italy. Domestic um, proceedings usually are the first stage um, going towards an international process. And actually, we do have um, at least one case pending in front of the European Court of Human Rights. Some action has also been taken with quasi judicial bodies, um, uh, including human rights bodies. Um, we don't have uh, many outcomes yet. It takes time to consider these cases. And certainly the jurisprudence or quasi-jurisprudence of these bodies is something we look forward to in the hope that it will clarify the duties of the different actors and the rights of those involved. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I think the, the human rights bodies you're talking about is the Nevin case, which was brought before, before the Human Rights mm -hmm. Committee. Um, there's one more question that maybe Felicity or, or Irini could, could talk to, um, which is this idea of port state control and, and kind of port states taking, criminalizing um, rescue by criminalizing masters, by criminalizing classification of vessels, etc. So we've seen this happen in, in Malta, for example. Um, so Felicity, I don't know whether you want to take a stab at an answer. Yes, um, well, one option is for the particular NGO to uh, register their vessel with a, with a state which will support um, human rights protections, which will offer diplomatic protection. So that could be could be one option. Um, I don't know, Irini, maybe you had a different different suggestion. No, I think that the choosing the right flag um, is certainly crucial. Eh? But um, I think it is also a matter of uh, um, undertaking taking the right decisions uh, even uh, when times are difficult. So for example, the decision of Sea-Watch 2 to enter into the Italian ports, um, which at the time seemed a hard decision to take, was the right step uh, because eventually it did allow you, uh, Italian courts um, to confirm uh, that there, there was a right in situations of distress uh, to do this. So sometimes uh, NGOs uh, have to take on their responsibility to take action even at their own risk so that the law can be clarified and that this is to the benefit of all those involved. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think those are the main questions. So there were a few other kind of comments that came in, but I think we've largely covered most of those um, in, in our discussion. Um, there was one question, um, Felicity, directed to you around kind of how is the shipmaster the subject of the obligation to rescue um, when the obligations under the convention generally are, are tied to the flag state. But I think you've largely covered that in your presentation, but I don't know whether you want to come in and um, expand yeah, on that. I would, I would like to just add that, of course, it's the responsibility of the flag state then to um, ensure that the shipmaster uh, renders assistance. This is usually tr done through um, domestic legislation, either imposing um, criminal or administrative sanctions, which is something we dis you discussed in the report, but also that I mentioned. So yes, definitely the, the flag state has a responsibility to ensure that the ship master does uh, render assistance. Thank you very much. Um, so we're already a few minutes um, after time. So unless anyone has anything urgent they would like to clarify, Gabby, I don't know whether you wanted to add anything at this point, Irini, Felicity. No? Um, okay, so I will pause the words back to uh, Paolo if he, he wants to make any closing remarks and then um, we can close our webinar. Thank you, Jean-Pierre, and thank you, Felicity, Gabrielle, and Irini. Uh, I think that uh, this was a much-needed uh, study, uh, and this uh, pioneer uh, report uh, was really very helpful uh, to clarify 
many of the questions that we start with uh, around one year ago. And uh, I would like to congratulate uh, Bickle for uh, coordinating uh, this study and this conference. And uh, this will be follow up uh, by making the report available uh, to the several regulators institutes uh, across the world uh, and especially here in Europe uh, to analyze and to learn uh, uh, from this report what they need to adapt in their own uh, local procedures, uh, take a look at their own regulations. So um, I think it was very interesting. And, uh, and again, uh, con congratulations to the panel and, uh, and to Bicol uh, for this uh, wonderful present and very useful presentation. Thank you very much, Paolo. And, and again, thank you to the Mirpuri Foundation for the support of the research and, and the project. Um, with that in mind, I will say the report is available on the Pickle website. Um, I do very much see the report as something that is there to start a conversation or rather take the next step in a conversation. So hopefully there will be further discussions such as the questions that we received, but also more um, over the coming days, weeks and months. Um, finally, I just want to take a quick second to thank the Bickle team uh, for their support of this event in particular, and in particular, uh, Brettley Dawson, Carmel Brown, who are our marketing people, and um, more importantly, Liam, who is behind the Bickle logo over there, um, without who this webinar would not have been run technically. So thank you very much to them, and thank you very much to Felicity, Gabby, Irini, and Paolo. Uh, for being here, for being on this panel, and thank you very much to the audience for sticking with us, despite going over time a little bit. So thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Have a good evening. Thank, yes, you. thank you. Bye bye now. Bye.